<clears throat> Hello, my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. It's a church in Lawrence, South Carolina. It's about 45 minutes from here. My, my friends, I come out here today because I care for your souls, because I love my neighbor. Scripture says that I am to love my neighbor as myself, that I am to love the Lord my God and to love my neighbor as myself. And my friends, in obedience to that, I come out here to warn you about your sins, to warn you about God's judgment, and to warn you about His wrath against sin, and to present to you the message of life, the good news of Jesus Christ. My friends, you can be reconciled to your Creator God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He can save you from your sins and give you the gift of everlasting life. Life which shall never end. Dear friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to look at today is in the book of Romans, chapter 1, in verse 16, when the Apostle Paul says these words, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Dear friends, the title of this sermon is, Are You Ashamed of the Gospel? Are You Ashamed of the Gospel? See, my dear friends, I encounter people time after time again on the streets, here at the abortion clinic, and elsewhere that I do evangelism, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, yet they are utterly ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, they are people who would be in churches, perhaps even related to ministers of the gospel, perhaps even some of them themselves being in the ministry work. Yet they do not find the word of the cross to be the power of God, but instead foolishness to their ears. My friends, many of you think that the message of the cross is just that. In fact, there's two categories of people perhaps here today. Those claiming to be followers of Christ, yet are ashamed of the cross. You are certainly lost and dead in your sins, and simply a hypocrite. And then the second category would be those who are certainly not claiming to be Christians, and thereby are open uh, in, their, in their disgust of the message of the cross. You know, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. My friends, it is the skandalon. It, that's the Greek word used there. It's a scandalous truth. It's offensive to the human in and of himself. It's offensive to our fallen nature because the gospel calls us out in our sin and calls us to repent or perish. And my friends, in like manner, I will preach to you that Scandalon, I will preach to you that scandalous reality. I will preach to you the gospel that Jesus Christ was persecuted for preaching, which the Apostle Paul was persecuted for preaching, which the Apostle Peter was persecuted for preaching, which the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout all of the ages of the church have been persecuted for preaching. That is the gospel that I'll preach to you. And the question, my indictment will be toward you, or my... my, my question that I would have for you is simply this. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the gospel message? My friends, Jesus in his ministry here on earth preached the gospel time and time and time again. In fact, in Mark 1.15 we see that he says the words, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he called sinners to repent and believe the good news. That, that was what was among his lips, upon his lips daily, was the message of the gospel, of repentance and forgiveness of sin in his name. Listen to the words of Luke 9. He says in verse 26, For whoever is ashamed of me, this is Jesus speaking, and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. My dear friends, and I call you that because I care for your soul and I care for your child. I do want to stop here and say that I am a pastor of a church and I commit myself and my congregation to take care of you, to help you as best as we can, to the fullest of our ability, to walk through this pregnancy with you and this child. Dear friends, you do not have to take the life of the innocent. My friends, you do not have to slaughter your child. There is a place just up the street 
quiver full adoptions. They will walk you through the entire process of childbearing. And then they will find you someone to adopt that child. There are people waiting. I have friends. My closest brother in the Lord it has been cleared by the state to adopt. And he is a faithful soldier of Christ. My friends, he would be more than happy to take your child and to take care of that precious life. Dear friends, you do not have to do this. We care for you. I ha I'm here representing a whole plethora of people. There may not be many out here, but my friends, I stand as the federal head among them to represent them before you. I stand on their behalf saying, come, and there are people who are willing to help. I commit myself personally to help you, my friends, to deal with you honestly about your soul, to help you with that precious child. Do not kill your baby. Do not murder your child. Babies are murdered in this place. In fact, I noted yesterday the roof of this building is red, just like the blood of the children, the innocent children that are slaughtered here, week in and week out. And that is why I call out to you doctors and you nurses, you receptionists, to repent and believe the gospel, to turn from your sins, and to believe upon Christ for life and life eternal. Many of you would, as I said a moment ago, claim to be believers in Christ. Yet you are ashamed of His gospel, and you are ashamed of His words, and therefore He tells you that if you're ashamed of His words here in Luke 9, He will be ashamed of you when He comes in His glory. And Scripture says that He is coming quickly. He is on His way to return and to judge the world, both the living and the dead, in righteousness. He is, lit, he is coming to do that very thing. In fact, listen to the words of Revelation 22.20. This is the second to last verse, uh, last verse of all Scripture. It says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is tarrying in His return. He is delaying, but only to give the wicked time to repent. My friends, it is in God's patience that Christ has yet to return because God is still giving you time to repent to turn from your sins and to believe upon Christ. There is little time left, my friends. Every moment we are getting closer to the edge of eternity. Listen to the words of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. When the Apostle Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he says, The Lord is not slow about His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Oh, my friends. Oh, my friends. He is waiting in His patience. Listen to the words of verse 3 of this, of this chapter. He says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mockery, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water by, and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, bringing flood, being flooded with water. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of godly men. My friends, the destruction of ungodly men is not idle. It is, a, it is at our hand. It is, it is at the doorstep. Judgment day is soon to come. And Christ will be ashamed of you on the day of judgment if you are ashamed of the word of the cross. Oh, my friends, just before I got up to preach this very sermon, as I am now, I was able to go and read an article about a friend of mine, a, a faithful soldier of Christ, a brother in the Lord who was preaching the gospel. And he encountered a couple that were claiming to be church planners. And they were offense. They, they, they caught very much offense at the gospel message. They were offended to their core and thought it a horrible atrocity for the man to be preaching the gospel in the open air. But oh, how wrong they were to believe that the preaching of the gospel is the wrong thing. They are wrong by believing it is wrong. Oh, my friends, the word of the cross, the preaching of the gospel is precious for it brings the sheep of Christ to His fold. The preaching of the cross brings sinners to salvation so that they might not have to go to hell and instead may go to heaven. 
The preaching of the gospel exalts and glorifies the manifold, multifaceted, multi-layered grace of Almighty God. It exalts the fact that God Almighty has extended forth His arm in mercy and grace to accomplish salvation for His people. In fact, the psalm, uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 2 that the Lord has established His King in Zion. He has established Him on His throne in heaven. And He is making His enemies to be the footstool of His feet. Oh, my friends, and if you are the enemies of Christ, you will be the footstools of His feet. You will be crushed under the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. My friends, that is why I cry out to you this day to repent and to be reconciled to God, to be made right with your Creator. To be made right with your Creator God, who has formed you in your mother's womb. And so how dare you try and attempt to come here this day to take your own child out of yours. And you young men as well. How dare you claim to be a man when you cannot even man up and watch after your own child and your own lady. Man up, young men. Even you older men, you need to become manly men. Mature men. You need to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You need to be saved from your hypocrisy and your boyishness. So going back to Romans 1, which is where we started off, that's the text of Scripture that we're looking at. Just a note on the context, this is the opening of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, and here in chapter 1, he is establishing and putting forth his thesis statement for the book. This is what all of Romans, and quite frankly, all of the Bible is about. In its simplest form, you can see that the Scriptures all are in uniform testimony of this one glorious truth, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. In fact, He Himself said in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man did not come to... He said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was His express purpose. So the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And my friends, that is the word that I am here to preach to you today. So the Apostle Paul continues, or he begins, I should say, in verse 16. He begins with the word, For I am not ashamed. Now, the reason he gives the word for, or you could insert the word because here, is because of what is found in verse 15. In fact, I'll begin at verse 14. He says, I am under obligation to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So, so the Apostle Paul is saying here, he was eager to preach the gospel to the Romans. Why? Because he's not ashamed of it, as he answers the question in verse 16. Because he is not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of the gospel. Many times in our lives, dear friends, I'm sure that you can even recall a point in your life in which perhaps you were younger and you were apprehended by your parents because you had committed some evil deed. Perhaps you had disobeyed them concerning watching television or eating something that you were not supposed to at that time. And they apprehended you and you were ashamed of what you had done. You were guilty and it was written all over you. And you did not want to speak about it. You did not want to bring it up. You did not want to remember it. My friends, so too it is with those who are ashamed of the gospel. Oh, my friends, many people oftentimes will say that they are ashamed of perhaps a particular uh, political situation in the United States. Or perhaps they're ashamed of some wicked deed that a friend or family member has done. They will say that they are ashamed of it, they're disgusted by it, and they do not even want to have anything to do with it. Oh, my friends, those who claim to believe the gospel, but they do not proclaim it, and they do not live in an accordance to it, they are likewise, they are ashamed of it. My friends, if you are here today, and you claim to be a Christian, here to slaughter your child, and you're steeped in your fornication, and your drunkenness, and your dishonor of the holy God of glory who made you, God is righteous and pure. His standards are so high, my friends, you cannot attain to it. 
You cannot attain. Lord, help me. Lord, I'm, just give me strength, Lord. My friends, you cannot attain to right, God's righteous standard. And you are condemned. You are condemned. My friends, but many of you would say, well, I've had a religious experience. I've been to church before. A preacher told me I was a Christian. My friends, it does not matter. If you are ashamed of the gospel, then you are certainly lost. You were like the great multitude that abandoned the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6, or excuse me, in John chapter 6. In fact, I will go to that very text to show you what you are like, to show you at the, posi the position you are in right now if you reject the gospel. And you find it to be foolishness. You find what I'm doing out here to be foolishness. I just had a lady come by a moment ago, step, stop onto the driveway, open her window, and declared to me that what I was doing out here was ineffective. And that is not the way to love people. That's not the way to care for people. I said, my, my, my friend, these people are dead in sin and they're on their way to hell. The only way they can be saved is through believing the gospel. I must love you in this way. I must preach to you the gospel. The one who loves you much is the one who tells you the most truth. The one who tells you the most truth is the one who cares for you the most. Because our Lord Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And I'm out here to bring to you that very truth. But nonetheless, if you believe that you're a Christian but you are here today and you live in blatant sin, you're a hypocrite, my friends. You need to be saved. There's a special place in hypocrites for hell. There's a special place in hell for hypocrites. Perhaps you yourself, though, I will stop here and say this. Perhaps you yourself, you're not even a, claiming to be a Christian. You're just a pagan. You just deny the God of Scripture altogether. Well, that is a, likewise a dangerous position to be in, as I'll show in a moment. But let's go back to John 6, as I said. And this is after Jesus has taught some very, very offensive things. And he's preached the gospel. In verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father sends me, draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 51, he said, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus said in, uh, in verse 35, I'm just giving you a little bit of a survey of this. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Verse 40, he says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. But notice what happens down in verse, we'll start at verse 60. It says, Therefore many of His disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that His disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending the way He has before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. And He was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to Me unless it has been granted Him from the Father. My friends, you will only be saved if God so wills to pour out His mercy upon you this day. I know that you're dead in your sins. You cannot raise yourself to spiritual life. I recognize that. But I come out here trusting that God will save His elect. God will save His sheep. God will bring those whom He wills. And He will harden whom He desires for His own glory. And that is a difficult statement. And because Jesus preached the gospel of absolute sovereign grace and absolute divine sovereignty over human salvation, His disciples, who were his, only His disciples visibly, that is, they just followed Him, but they truly weren't following Him in their hearts. It says they left Him and they were no longer following after Him. My friends, many of you have left the side of the Lord Jesus never to really begin following Him in the first place. I'm not saying you can be saved and lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you're eternally saved. But for those of you who claim to be a Christian, perhaps you bore fruit in your life for a period of time. But after that, you've now walked in, in blatant sin and constant immorality. 
constant rebellion to God and you don't see any any fruit, then you're not truly converted. You're not truly a believer. Instead, you're lost. You're lost. You're dead in your sins, my friends. My friends, you need to be reconciled to God and not ashamed of the gospel message. Not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. <laughs> my friends, I exhort you I plead with you, don't lose your souls for your sins. Even you who have had a religious experience, but you're not saved, just cry out to God and He'll genuinely save you. He saved me from false conversion. I was a false convert for years of my life. But God saved me by His grace. Excuse me. Dear friends, please. Be reconciled to God. Even you who pagans, as I said a moment ago, trust on Christ. And do not lose your souls for your sins. For if you are ashamed of the gospel, He will be ashamed of you. Look to Him and live. Live eternally. My friends, now the question has to be asked. What is the Gospel? What is the Gospel message according to the Bible? Well, before I look at that, I would like to fulfill my promise I gave a few moments ago concerning you who are pagans and who deny the existence of God, perhaps, or say, well, I'm just not a Christian at all. I want to give you some somber words from verse 18 of Romans 1. This is just two verses down from the verse we're looking at. That is verse 16. So in verse 18, the Apostle Paul says these words, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God nor give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the, in, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-foot animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to a degrading passion. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way the men also abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they, they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Oh, my dear friends, if you fit into that category, which I'm sure many of you do, believe the gospel message. And now the question can rightly be asked, what is the gospel? What is this truth that you so clearly continue to reference? So my dear friends, I will tell you what the gospel is. But first let me preface it by telling you the bad news. See my friends, the word gospel means good news. But what is the bad news? See, we must understand the bad before we understand the good. 
Well, this may shock you. This may confuse you, but I shall explain. The bad news is that God is good. That's the bad news. And we are not. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that. Dear friends, God is so righteous and holy and pure, He cannot look upon evil. He cannot look upon wickedness and sin. He is pure and gloriously gracious. He is merciful and kind, as many of you presume upon. But never is that to the neglect of His holiness and His righteousness. God is so holy, so righteous, and He must punish sin. He must punish the sinner. Oh, my friends, He must do that. And so He comes along in Scripture and He gives us His law. And His law is a reflection of His character. He says you shall not lie. You shall not murder, as, you're, as many of you are planning on doing today. He says you shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not dishonor God by using His name in an irreverent manner. You shall not fornicate. Oh, my friends, you shall not commit homosexuality. That is an abomination in the eyes of God. But the problem is, is that humankind daily break these commandments. Even I myself have fall short. Even though I try, I fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are by default in and of ourselves haters of God. You hate God, my friends. That's why you're here this day. As Romans 1 says, it says that you are haters of God in verse 30 there. And therefore you are consigned to hell, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, that, that, that the ungodly go into eternal punishment, eternal turmoil, eternal lostness. My friends, please believe upon Christ, even if you're not here for an abortion. Get out of this place. They kill children here. Don't support this evil. Don't support this evil, my friends. Don't support this wickedness that is in this place that the Bible condemns. In fact, in Proverbs 6, it says, There are seven things which the Lord hates, and one of them is hands that shed innocent blood. I say this to your shame, and I say it that you might be ashamed before the Almighty. I'll give you a picture of how holy God is, my friends, of how righteous the Creator is. In Leviticus chapter 10, listen to this. This is how serious God takes disobedience. Verse 1, Now Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which He had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Verse 3, Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me I will be treated as holy, and before all people I will be honored. My friends, God is so holy, He must punish your sin. He must punish your rebellion and your iniquity. He must punish the wicked. And so here in Leviticus 10, we even see sons of Aaron. These are men that were a part of the priestly line that God had ordained. And yet, even them, God is not a respecter of persons. If you dishonor Him, He will certainly bring it upon you. He will bring your sin upon you, my friends. And that's why that text reads that the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed those men. Friends, do not lose your souls. Once your soul is lost, it's gone. 
My friends, don't slaughter your child. Don't slaughter your own child who has been given to you as a gift from the Almighty. Do not lose your soul for your sin, but believe the gospel of grace. So we are condemned to hell and we have no hope. The Bible says though in Galatians 4.4 4, that God, being rich in mercy, being abounding in kindness, sent His Son Jesus. Jesus came and fulfilled the law as He says in Matthew 5.17 and He died upon the cross. Jesus satisfied God's wrath against sin. He took upon Himself the judgment that God has, uh, that He has that He is ready to pour out upon you. He took it upon Himself for those who believe in Him, for those who would trust in Him. Christ died for the elect of God on the cross out of the love for God, out of the love of God for sinners. My friends, He satisfied God's judgment against sins and He rose from the grave. And He rose three days later. And He is alive today. Praise be to God, He is alive. He reigns as King of glory on His throne in heaven. As the words of, of Psalm 24 read, give me one moment, please. As Psalm 24 itself says that, that Christ is the King of glory. He is reigning on His throne today. As the glorious King of all the universe. It says in Proverbs 20. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. And he, For He has founded it upon the waters and established it, is it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God, from the God of His salvation. This is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may enter in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and, be, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. My friends, He reigns now as the King of glory. And the Bible says, you must repent. You must turn from your sins. Turn from your rebellion and trust on Christ. And God will forgive you of your sins. He'll wash you clean as He's cleansed me and all of His people who have been saved up to this point. He will save you. And He will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. Christ will save you. He'll eternally redeem your souls. He will wrap you in His very righteousness so that you are seen by God as having lived Jesus' life. This is the good news of the message. Of the, this is the good news of the gospel message. My friends, are you ashamed of it? Do you believe it? I exhort you who claim to be Christians, turn from your hypocrisy and believe Christ. You pagans, turn to Christ and live. Turn to Him and look, all the ends of the earth, and be saved from your sins. So we've seen here in Romans 1, that the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, that he was not ashamed of the gospel. And my friends, may on the day of judgment, we all be found to say those same words, unto the glory of God. And that is the note upon which I shall end. To God be the glory for the wonderful things He has done, and for His glorious character and His holiness shown in His word. Oh, my friends, believe upon Christ so that you may live, that you might have life to the fullest. Look to Christ for the glory 
of God. And to God be the glory forever. Amen. Amen.